Hi, good morning. It's Jason from Fraser Valley Rose Farm and today I want to take you through a quick overview of the topic of growing roses in general aimed at the beginner. Now it is a wet, rainy, early spring day here where I live and that is a good time to start considering growing roses. The reason why is because this is the time when it's great to get them in the ground. There's lots of moisture, lots of time for them to establish before the main season. It's also when in North America, in March, April, you'll find the most roses in the stores. So your assortment, your selection will be the highest. So today I want to go through the very basics overview of the topics. I'm going to talk about the roses themselves, an overview of the plant and why you might want to grow it. Uh, number two, I'm going to talk about its growing conditions. And third, I'm going to talk about care instructions. Let's start with a quick bit on why you'd want to grow roses at all. Roses are a wonderfully productive shrub. Unlike some other flowering shrubs in the landscape, roses, at least modern roses, can bloom over a long period of the year. They bloom in many colors, they bloom in different heights, there's different roses for different shapes and sizes for your landscape. They associate with other plants well. You can put them into a vegetable garden, believe it or not, an ornamental garden. They contribute well, they feed the bees, they're good for wildlife, overall good habitat for for birds in the winter uh, they have their hips uh, so they are productive productive plants and they have a bit of a reputation as something that's difficult to grow but that's not true once you get to know the conditions that they're looking for in the garden Roses are a plant that have traveled with human civilization for long enough they barely need an introduction but from a garden point of view I'm going to introduce them as a northern temperate climate shrub or at least that's how their genetics started out. Uh, they've since been crossbred to have a few of the subtropical species in there so now you have their distribution worldwide. They are a shrub in the rose family, no surprise there. They share that family with such hard-working plants as apples, plums, cherries, strawberries and blackberries and raspberries. Uh, blackberries and raspberries share something special with roses insofar as they have their thorns and they act as bramble so that's one of the natural habits of roses in the wild is that they have that thorny brambly scrambly kind of habit we have since domesticated them quite a lot so we get some more well-behaved shrubby type forms in terms of the size and shape for the garden that's the next thing I want to talk about and they break them into classes you can have miniature roses that tend to be in the range of 18 inches to 24 inches uh, sometimes over that but that's the that's the general height floribundas which might average between two and three feet in height maybe a little more in some cases Hybrid teas might average more around three or four feet. Grandifloras and shrubs are usually a little bit more than that in the four and five and six foot range. And then you have climbers and ramblers, which can go to, I'm gonna say almost unlimited heights, but uh, an average small climber might be in the range of eight to 10 feet. So between all of those different sizes, you can definitely find something that will fit your garden. In terms of flower form, uh, the one that you're most accustomed to seeing in the store might be that uh, solitary, uh, I'm going to call it a florist rose. It has that sort of very distinctive high pointed bud. Uh, that's the hybrid tea form uh, and it's a solitary form. Of course, there are a ton of different forms of roses and the most... Uh, the most distinct to that is going to be something like the cluster flowering forms. The cluster flowering forms may have single rings of petals or they may have double petals, but look at something like the floribundas, look at some of the wild roses. I'm going to put up some pictures here as well of things that have the cluster flowering form. So, uh, and then there's a bunch in between that have more petals, less petals, uh, all sorts of different flower forms in the rose family. And I'll go into that in a separate video. All right, the other thing you need to know is the color of those flowers. They range the full spectrum except for blue. So everything from pink, white, yellow, orange, uh, even into mauve and purple, but not quite a true blue. Uh, so that's the one area where it isn't there, but uh, you know, science may come up with it sooner or later in a sort of a, a genetically modified way. But as far as natural colors of roses, that's the one that's missing. They also have a lot of different patterns, striped flowers, uh, things that have different colored fronts and reverses of petals, things that have eyes on them. So that's a newer innovation in breeding is roses that have a color patch in the middle that, uh, that is darker than the rest of the petals. So there's lots of different colors and forms that you can choose from the garden. One thing that roses are very well known for, but it varies quite a lot from variety to variety, is their fragrance. Now with all these variations in roses, the one 
tip that I'll give you straight up front is to start referring to your roses on a site that I know called Help Me Find. I'm going to li link that below the video. I'm also going to put that up on the screen right now. This is like a Wikipedia for roses. So if you're trying to figure out if the rose that you're considering putting into your garden has a great scent and what kind of scent it has, this is the site that's going to tell you that. It's also going to talk about that height. It's also going to talk about that bloom form. It'll talk about the bloom period. Most roses these days have a bloom period that goes most of the season or all of the season. Although some of the roses, especially the species roses and the old garden roses, may have a more limited bloom period, you'll want to know that and if that's suitable for you before you go ahead and make that purchase. So take down this site. It's going to be your uh, gateway drug into roses, I promise you. One final note that goes into the overview of roses themselves is that some roses are grafted and some roses are grown on their own roots. Grafting is a production system where a rootstock of a very vigorous variety of rose is grown and then then a scion variety is grafted into the top of that. This is a similar production system that you'll see in fruit trees, in orchard fruit trees, or even in sometimes uh, production greenhouses uh, for tomatoes and, and peppers. Um, it, it tries to impart some of the vigor and disease resistance of the root variety into the top stock variety. So that's one production system and that's been the dominant production system through most of the 20th century. More recently, a lot of roses have been evaluated for strength on their own roots. And so that's the second group of roses is the own root roses. It was getting a bit windy out there. So I've moved to a more sheltered location to talk about the growing conditions that your roses will want. So let's first talk about sun exposure. Because roses are a reblooming plant, and because they bloom so profusely, they need lots of energy if you want to have them perform their best. So the general recommendation for roses is to site them in full sun or only part shade. Full sun generally means about six hours of uninterrupted sun in a day. Uh, so that's not a whole ton, actually. In a, in a climate like mine, in the summer, the days get up to about uh, 15 hours, so really it's only about a half day of sun. So if you have morning sun strongly, but a little bit of afternoon shade, that's fine. Uh, in a warmer climate, I've heard from a lot of rose growers that a bit of high dappled shade or afternoon shade actually helps with the performance of their roses because it shields them from the hottest part of the day when they'll stress out due to moisture loss. So that's what you want to do for sun. If you don't have a whole ton of spaces where you have lots of sun, there are some roses that have that tolerate part shade. I've done a whole video on that where I talk about roses that are more tolerant of shade. I'll link that one up above as well. So you have some choices in that regard. Uh, if you are looking to put your roses in a container, yes, absolutely, that's fine. And that way you can take advantage of those areas of your yard or your deck or your patio that get a little more sun and you can move your roses to suit the needs of the plant. Now let's talk about soil. In general, roses are tolerant of a wide range of different soils. They'll go from a somewhat sandy soil all the way to a somewhat clay soil. But if you look at that spectrum there from sandy to clay, they generally like it a little bit more on the clayish side or the heavier soil side. The reason for this is because roses depend on a consistent supply of moisture and a consistent supply of nutrients for that high performing flowering. And it's harder to get that in a sandy soil. A sandy soil tends to drain from its nutrients and its water a lot quicker than a clayish soil will. So although roses will tolerate a wide range uh, of soils, you can usually find that they'll perform a little bit better on that clayish end. And if you're growing them in a sandy soil, you just have to be a little more on top of the fertilizing and, uh, and feeding as well. Uh, last thing I'll talk about in terms of siting your roses is in terms of support. If you've chosen something like a rambler or a climber, you'll have to do something to support their growth. Generally, I like a low fence or a trellis, but wider rather than taller. Roses going straight up tend to shoot up and then flower right at the very top. Whereas if you can train them a little bit more horizontally, you'll get more flowers along the entire length of the stem. They'll send out side shoots and you get roses all the way along the length of the stem if you could train them a little more horizontally. Uh, of course, there are some roses that perform a little bit better in a vertical fashion um, with some training and those ones are generally called pillar roses. So you can actually have a rose, if, uh, if you look on 
uh, rose resources and they say it's a good subject for pillaring, that's what it means, is that it's one of those roses that if you put it up something quite vertical, it will still continue to send flowers along the entire length of the rose. Just a quick return back to talking about container roses before I go on to the general care instructions for roses. Containers are a natural limit on the reservoir of nutrients and moisture for your rose. And you want to make that reservoir as well and appropriately sized to the size of the rose as you can possibly do. And if you're even a little bit on the large side, that's good. So choose the largest size container you can afford for that rose. If you find that your container is drying out quickly between waterings, it's only going one or two days and then it's dry again. Uh, if you see signs of moisture stress, that is that the inner leaves are starting to turn yellow, uh, poor flowering performance, that's a good sign that you've, uh, you've inappropriately sized your rows to too small of a container, so larger is better in this case. I have done a whole separate video on container roses. I'll link that one above as well, but that's my final note on container roses. Very doable, but choose the largest size container that you, that you can afford for the space. All right, let's talk about uh, feeding, fertilizing, pruning, and all of that type stuff, because people get a little bit, I'm gonna call it self-conscious, that professional growers or rose you know, experts are going to look down on the way they take care of the roses. Roses are no different than any other plant, except for that one proviso that if you treat them a little bit better, they'll flower a little bit better for you because they have that ability to reflower strongly throughout the season. So in that regard, the one thing you can do to help that along is to fertilize regularly, starting early in the season. I'm not talking uh, heavy levels of fertilizer. You can look at the fertilizer package and start at half the strength, but do it frequently and then see how your rose responds. Again, I have done another video on fertilizing roses completely, uh, but the, the point on this one here, and the only thing I'm going to say is, uh, you will get your best performance from roses if you fertilize them regularly throughout the early part of the growing season. You can ease off towards the back end of the growing season as you head into fall and winter. You don't really need to send a, a lot more nutrients into your roses, uh, but early on in the season, regular fertilizing it will help you out. Uh, now, in terms of watering, I mentioned before that roses, well, they want both a good level of fertilizer, they want a good level of moisture. Moisture. So regular watering is a must if you have an, uh, a timed irrigation system. That's probably the best thing, so it's not relying on you to go out there and and uh, and figure on when your roses uh, need water. Um, so that's uh, that's the second thing. Now the one that trips a lot of people up is the idea of pruning roses, and pruning roses is no different than pruning any other shrub. Generally speaking, your best time for pruning is early in the season. Uh, early spring, late winter, uh, just as it's starting to think about coming into its uh, flush of growth for the season, uh, you at that time have the opportunity to reshape the size of the shrub, bring it down a little bit, open it up. But it's really nothing more than that. A lot of roses don't really require pruning early on. So if you've planted a new rose in your landscape and it's the first year, second year, third year in, and it's still just putting on a framework, you don't have to do anything with that. But when you see a rose that starts to jump up and have unproductive wood, it's flowering right at the top of the thing, that's because you've neglected the pruning for some period of time. It's not fatal. Uh, you can go back the next spring or even during the growing season up to a certain point and take that down as you need to. The only time I would avoid doing pruning, I mean, people think, oh, early spring, winter, I've missed my window. That's not true. You can continue pruning throughout the spring and summer up to a certain point. Where I would stop is if your climate uh, gets very warm and you suspect that pruning is going to stress out your plant, then I wouldn't prune during that time. I also wouldn't prune going into the fall and winter if you are in a cold area. If you're in a cold winter climate that is likely to damage your roses over the winter, then I would save that pruning for the spring. That way you'll see the winter damage at the same time. You can do your pruning uh, in the late, late winter and early spring. But as for the rest of it, uh, general pruning, deadheading, you can take care of that all the way through the spring, all the way into the summer. Before I go, I should talk a little bit about pests and diseases. And I, I think the first thing I'll say is that a lot of people hold too a high a standard when it comes to pests and diseases on their roses. A little touch of black spot, a little bit of powdery mildew, some aphids, a little bit of leaf damage. It isn't going to hurt your rose. It isn't going to hurt its roses production and uh, you're not being judged on it. I think that kind of judgy attitude that came with roses, maybe it's an offshoot of the rose exhibitions or something, uh, but you can be a perfectly successful rose gardener just as I am 
and, uh, and still accept that there's some damage to your roses from pests and diseases. Now there are certain limits to this and if you find that a large portion of your foliage is being defoliated by powdery mildew or that uh, Japanese beetles have come in and, uh, and wiped out your rose, there are specific strategies for each of these pests. Uh, but the, the point here is not to hold yourself to too high a standard. I'm going to say one more thing on pests and diseases, and it kind of runs against the grain of how people have run their rose gardens for many, many years. People have always felt, oh, I should have a rose garden where I put the perfect conditions. I have the perfect sunlight, I have the perfect soil, I have my irrigation system, and so I just run my roses alone in this garden. The problem is that grouping together any kind of plant in a large group like that makes them susceptible to big spikes in pest population and the natural predator populations don't move in that quickly because there's not a lot of diversity of plants and flowers. So roses associate well in the rest of your garden. They go beautifully into a vegetable garden. They go beautifully into any other ornamental type garden, mixed gardens. And what happens is the roses do a great job of feeding the bees and, and, uh, and flowering and fruiting and, and doing things over a long season. Well, the other plants do a great job of bringing in a balanced population of beneficial insects that help to wipe out the pests on your roses quite quickly. So that's the thing I'll say about pests and diseases. As I say, individual problems with pests and disease, if you have black spot or powdery mildew, there are strategies for each of those things. But the general rule is tolerate a little bit of pest and disease pressure on your plants. It's no big deal. And the second thing is try to encourage biodiversity in your garden. All right, that's all I have for you today as an introduction to growing roses. I hope I didn't scare you off with that last bit. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please drop those down below the video and I'll see what I can do to help.